Welcome back to the Doctor is in Television program. I'm Dr. David Morwood. I am a board-certified plastic surgeon right here in beautiful Monterey, California. Thank you very much for joining us. I'm delighted you could be here, and I am delighted to have as my first guest terrific genius, excellent surgeon, Dr. Michael Stunts. Dr. Stunts, thanks very much for being here. No problem. Happy to be here. Dr. Stunts, um, we spoke just before this program, and you're an expert in a lot of different fields, and we decided to teach the public and teach me <laughs> about appendicitis. I think this is a fascinating topic. It's misunderstood by the public. There are a lot of myths, a lot of misunderstandings. So what I'd like to do, Dr. Stunts, before we get into appendicitis, is let's talk about abdominal surgery and how you got to be a general surgeon. What's the training period like? Well, you start off by going to college, a regular four-year college. I went to Denison University in Ohio. Then once you finish that, you go on to medical school. And medical school for me was five years. I had initially started out as an MD-PhD program, but never finished the PhD part, but did five years of medical school. Normal, it's four. And, and, then, and where did you go to medical school, Michael? University of Arizona. University of Arizona. That's in Tucson. Mm -hmm. It's warm there. Yeah, it's very warm. <laughs> and growing up in Ohio, I didn't miss the winters. <laughs> and so from there, I did my training in Los Angeles at one of the county hospitals, Harbor UCLA, where I did general surgery. And that's a first year of internship. Uh, and then you do four more years of uh, residency training where you're actually clinical training in the middle of that I did two more years of research so I did three years of research on top of all of that well dr. Stunts, I want the record to state and of course since we're being recorded that I helped you to come to <laughs> Monterey <laughs> because I was at USC mm -hmm. before you and I came up to Monterey and then I got some phone calls about this young mm -hmm. surgeon looking uh, for a job <laughs> looking for a job where you train and it was an affiliated hospital we made some calls and helped you to come on up and it's yeah. been great having you in town yep haven't regretted it. It's been a wonderful place to live and raise my family. Well, it's, it's a great place to practice as well. Mm -hmm. So, Dr. Stunts, I think our audience knows when they see the word appendicitis. Mm -hmm. uh, our audience knows that itis means inflammation. So we can have arthritis, that's mm -hmm. inflammation of a joint. Mm -hmm. We can have cerebritis, that's inflammation of the brain. And colitis is inflammation of the colon. And so when we talk about appendicitis, that's mm -hmm. literally in Greek or perhaps it's Latin, mm -hmm. uh, that means inflammation of the appendix. So let's teach the public uh, what is the appendix and why do we have an appendix? Well, an appendix is what we call a vestigial or a remnant type organ that sits off of the colon. So you're, when you swallow food, it goes down your esophagus into your stomach and into your small intestine. The small intestine goes into the large intestine where the food is compacted to eliminate. At the very first part of the large intestine, on the right side and the lower part of your abdomen, sits a little finger-like projection. It's usually about the same size as your own pinky. And that's pretty consistent from uh, adulthood, childhood. Anyway, this small appendage uh, sits there and it can get obstructed or infected or in other ways go bad and then we have to take it out. So, it, Dr. Dr. Stunts, is that the cecum? It, it, does, is the appendix actually attached to the cecum? Yes. The cecum is the very first part of the large intestine and it sits off, uh, off of the end of that. Okay, so we know that the small intestine comes right off of the, the stomach pouch, mm -hmm. the gastric pouch, and there's three parts to that, right? Mm -hmm. The duodenum and the jejunum and the ileum. Mm -hmm. And then there's the cecum, which is sort of a softball-sized, mm. just the beginning of the colon, Correct. right? Mm -hmm. And uh, is it the ascending colon and the transverse colon and then the descending? And right, sigmoid it, colon and rectum. Yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. right. So, so you said that the colon pretty much prepares that bolus to be mm -hmm. eliminated. Right, right. There's so, some absorption of the water that happens there, compaction, you know, getting it ready for elimination. So you said that the appendix is a vestigial organ. Mm -hmm. So that must mean at one time it had a purpose or a function. Yeah. Is that true? Uh, yes. I, I mean, there's still some debate about this. There is theories that suggest that it might function even in humans. Uh, as a reservoir for normal bacteria. So if you get into a situation where you have intense diarrhea, your body's trying to eliminate everything, it will also eliminate all your normal bacteria. So this little pouch sits there and stores some of your normal bacteria, so once the infection is cleared, then you have this 
uh, more uh, population of normal bacteria that can then repopulate and digest, help you digest your food. And now there's some animals where that's a requirement for their life, you know, uh, ruminants and uh, chickens and other animals, they have a, appendices that are important and vital for their function and they do a similar thing. Well, that's fascinating. Now, is it true that it's full of sort of lymph tissue, mm -hmm. or is it just totally l like the large intestine? Well, it's pretty small, um, and it does have a, 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 a three-layer wall like the rest of the colon, and it does have lymphoid tissue in it. So these are this is all true. Um, but, but certainly, uh, because people get appendicitis and we take out the appendix, mm -hmm. we don't know that there's any problem or malfunction or dysfunction mm -hmm. after the appendix comes out, and so we know that uh, essentially it's almost optional. Right. Isn't that correct? In, in modern man, since we've been doing surgery on the appendix, we've been studying whether it uh, has an increased mortality to have the appendix out, and there doesn't seem to be any uh, change in the chance of death once your appendix is removed. Okay. So, Dr. Stuntz, again, let, if, when we talk about appendicitis, mm -hmm. there are so many myths mm -hmm. and so many misunderstandings. Part of, part of that Part of the reason for that, I think, is because appendicitis is so common. Mm -hmm. It can happen to babies, yes. right? Yeah. And it can happen to young people, teenagers, mm -hmm. and even in grade school people. Right. And it can happen all the way to people, mm -hmm. senior citizens. Yeah, my personal age range of taking out appendicitis is 18 months is the youngest one I've ever done, and 103 is the oldest one. Incredible. So, so let's talk about how the appendix, and you said it's like a like uh, it's a, like a little pouch, like, like a little pinky. worm, mm -hmm. like a pinky that comes off the cecum, mm -hmm. the first part of the colon. Mm -hmm. So how does that get inflamed? Well, uh, sometimes you never know. I'd say most of the time you never know. Uh, but something obstructs it generally is thought to be the normal thing that initiates the start of appendicitis. So it's this small organ, but it has a narrow channel to it. And if a stone that forms from your stool can get in there. We call that a fecalith, a small rock made of feces. And that can get stuck inside the uh, lumen or the inside tunnel of the appendix. And then that can create the sequence of events that leads to the death of the appendix and appendicitis. Okay, so there's this phrase, it hasn't been that long ago since I was in general <laughs> surgery, because I did general surgery. I imagine you took out your fair share of appendices. I did. I did general surgery before <laughs> I did plastic surgery, and we talked about something called a closed space infection, mm -hmm. right? Like the gallbladder can be perfectly normal, but if it gets obstructed, then that can develop a closed space infection, same mm -hmm. as the appendix. Yes. Same as the sinus. If mm -hmm. the sinus gets obstructed for some reason and it backs up, that's sinusitis. Mm -hmm. So. So the appendix gets obstructed and then sort of backs up and there's a closed space infection. Yes. Now that doesn't necessarily mean that it has ruptured, right? No. A, a ruptured, or, or I guess what we call it, uh, exploded appendicitis. Perforated. Perforated yeah. appendix. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean, that's not necessarily what happens if someone gets appendicitis. Right, that's sort of the natural history. By the time I see them, they are usually not yet perforated, but years ago and in the age before modern medicine, it was common that the appendix would get obstructed, inflamed, part of it would die or necrose, a hole would develop, and then peritonitis or generalized infection of the abdomen would occur, and it was a lethal disease. Okay, so Dr. Stuntz, let's teach the audience what we mean by the term mm -hmm. acute abdomen, Okay. right? Because I think that's a really vital clinical <laughs> sign in general surgery and in the emergency room. Isn't that correct? Yeah. Like, not everybody that has a tummy ache has an acute abdomen, certainly. Mm -hmm. And not everybody that has an acute abdomen has appendicitis. Mm -hmm. So how, let's teach the audience what we mean by acute abdomen. Okay. Uh, surgeons deal with acute abdomens all the time. Uh, they, it usually occurs when there's some major infection and po sometimes with bleeding, uh, but a major irritation is going on inside the abdomen and there's a sequence of clinical signs that you see uh, that tell you that there's something serious going on in there. And in the days before CAT scans, you used your physical exam to determine whether or not you needed this, this patient needed surgery. You might not know exactly why, but you knew something bad was going on under the hood. And so those signs are generally tenderness in the abdomen. Uh, and when you press on the abdomen, it's extremely sore. 
And then when you let go, what we call rebound tenderness, it, there's a rebound, even heightened tenderness or soreness. Okay. Now, is that synonymous with peritonitis? Yeah, that's peritonitis. Okay. And another thing that would go with that would be rigidity or very firm abdomen. So if, so if someone's got a soft abdomen and they're, oh, oh, that hurts, that's probably not acute abdomen or there's not a serious irritation or a surgical indication going on. Okay, so Dr. Stuntz, let's say a patient comes into the emergency room and the emergency room doctor evaluates the patient or you're called to evaluate the mm -hmm. patient. Now, there's a, there's a big difference between someone, say, like who has, who has food poisoning mm -hmm. and they feel horrible and their mm -hmm. belly hurts and they're throwing up, but they don't need an operation. No. That is compared to someone, let's say, that has an acute abdomen who may have been throwing up mm -hmm. and has a lot of pain, but they actually do. They're in an urgent situation for an operation. So how do you distinguish between the two? Yeah, there's a, there's a lot of ways. And we have tools now that we've developed to help us out. A CAT scan would be a, a good one where we can look inside of the abdomen. But it's usually a much more intense pain and it's more focal. So it's at one spot. And predictably, if it's your gallbladder, it's up high under your rib cage on the right. If it's your appendix, it's low down between the belly button and the hip bone, right about in the middle there. Uh, there's a, a distinct spot that hurts a lot. Uh, then if your colon ruptures, usually it happens in the sigmoid colon, so that's the left side. Uh, uh, upper middle could be an ulcer that's perforated. So you kind of get a clue as to where it's, what's going on by where it hurts the most and where you find the most tenderness or soreness. And the other thing, if, you, uh, if the patient has a very serious level of pain relative to what they're used to. So we're all used to having stomach aches and problems and being sick and the flu, but these are orders of magnitude worse. So most of the time the patient or the family members know that's not normal, we have to get to the emergency room. So it's a, it's a heightened level. And then a high fever would be another thing. Over 101, 102, 103, those are starting to get serious. That needs evaluated. Okay, so typically we think of someone with appendicitis, mm -hmm. they need an operation. Yeah. A and hopefully they, they get an operation before the appendix bursts or yes. ruptures, mm -hmm. correct? Yes. So are there other ways to treat appendicitis besides with surgery? Yes, you can, the Europeans are studying this very extensively right now, looking at um, using antibiotics in simple appendicitis to treat the infection. And since it's an infection, if you have a patient who's otherwise healthy and you, have, you catch the process relatively early, uh, the white count isn't very high, and there aren't some other things, evidence of perforation, evidence of a fecalith, uh, diabetes in the patient, otherwise the patient's pretty well off essentially early, then you can try a course of antibiotics and it's successful 90 plus percent of the time. Uh, if there's other things going on, you catch it later or it's perforated, it's generally better to go in there and get it out. So Dr. Stuntz, I remember from my general surgery days mm -hmm. at Beth Israel mm -hmm. that there were certain patients who would be too sick mm -hmm. for other reasons mm -hmm. and they had appendicitis. Let's say there was somebody who had really bad pneumonia mm -hmm. and they happened to be in the intensive care unit and mm -hmm. by bad, strange coincidence, they got appendicitis. Mm. We would try to sort of hold off, tie yes. them off with antibiotics yes. and not take, them to, not take them to the operating room. Yeah, and so at the other end of the spectrum is the sickest, nastiest appendicitis. Sometimes we treat that with the antibiotics and get the infection calmed down and generally Months or weeks later, we would go back and take out the appendix. Uh, but if there's a big flu fluid collection or uh, pocket of pus inside the abdomen, we can use CAT scans to drain it. We wouldn't do surgery on that patient. We take them to radiology and remove some of that material. But if you can drain the material and treat treat the patient with antibiotics, you can sometimes get a very bad situation to an easier situation to deal with. And okay. we do it that we do that. Okay. So now that we're talking about the surgical treatment of it, mm -hmm. there's one other thing I want to talk about. Before we had all these sophisticated tests, MRIs mm -hmm. and CAT scans, mm -hmm. or let's just say the CAT scanner's broken one night and <laughs> you examine the patient, there used to be something fairly common called an exploratory, mm -hmm. exploratory laparotomy, mm -hmm. where the surgeon knew that there was a bad infection or, or serious process going on. We weren't sure exactly what was going on, but you brought to the, the patient to the operating room to look inside. That's called an exploratory. Yeah. Now, I think that's a lot less frequent now. Isn't we, that true? We tend to do that with cameras now. We do laparoscopic uh, surgeries in general where 
you put a small hole in the belly button region and you use cameras to look inside and see what's going on. Um, and you can do that and most of my appendectomies, almost all of them now, are done laparoscopically. Okay, so that's fascinating to me. So let's talk about how you go about taking out the appendix. Mm -hmm. Let's say you diagnose appendicitis. The physical, the history mm -hmm. is consistent with your physical exam and perhaps the CAT scan backs up your presumptive diagnosis. So you take the patient to the operating room. So what do you do? Do you make an incision? You get the cameras mm -hmm. out right away? <laughs> is there a McBurney's point where you have to look at that little area you were talking about? Yeah. What do you do next? Well, surgeons vary on how they do it, uh, but in general, uh, you put the patient to sleep, so they're under general anesthesia. They're completely asensate. They don't feel anything. And then you make a small hole in the belly button region, and you stick a special little needle into the abdominal cavity. And then that allows gas to go in. And so you inflate the abdomen, like a pregnant woman, is how the abdomen starts to look. It's just this big, distended abdomen. And then you take the needle out, and you put in uh, what's called a trocar and a port. So you use a little special device to go into the abdomen, and it's got a channel, so you can put the camera or instruments through it. And so after I put the port in, I'll put the camera through the port and look around, and see what I got. And see it's appendicitis, I'll put two more ports in, in the low abdomen, one goes just above the pubic bone, the other close to McBurney's point, but low in the abdomen on the right. And uh, then I'll use the instruments and I'll have the nurse or scrub technician holding the camera and I'll grab the appendix, look at it, and then I remove it. And we use a special energy instrument called a sauna surge device. Um, there's other ones that are out there too. And you basically go through the fat and the blood vessels to the base of the appendix. And then I use a stapling device across the base of the appendix. It just puts a little line of staples, closes it off, cuts it off all in one smooth motion. And then I put the appendix in a bag and I pull it out one of the ports and we culture it to see what grows out of it. And then I clean up any of the fluid that's around there and the procedure is essentially over from that point. Well, that's fascinating. So that's all with these little telescopes, laparoscopes. Mm -hmm. Now, Dr. Stuntz, what if you find out when you put in the little little scope mm -hmm. that the appendix has actually ruptured? Does that, mm -hmm. does that change the management of the operation or the management of the patient? Well, yeah, it's, that's more serious, so it gets harder to take it out because there's usually more things stuck to the appendix and it's, everything's more inflamed or irritated and it's harder to see the normal structures around it. But in general, the body's walled that off and you can pick it apart you're gently and get it to the point where you now have what looks like a, a known situation and then you do essentially what I just described. You take down the blood vessel, the meso appendix, and then transect the appendix at its base some of the worst ones are you have to remove a little bit of the colon. That can happen too. And so, uh, and then when you're finally done, um, then you really rinse it out well because I think that's a big part of removing some of the uh, infection that's all going on. Okay, so then typically does a patient take antibiotics afterwards? Do they stay in the hospital overnight? Yeah. How is a patient treated postoperatively? Yeah, antibiotics are extremely important in this disease. And really how sick they are and how long they stay in the hospital depends on the infection they have. So certain types of bacterial infections are worse than others. And so the next day after the appendix is out, I'll assess the patient. And if they need a week's worth of antibiotics, they'll be in the hospital for a week. Most patients, after the first day, their infection's gone. They feel a ton better. They're sore where I've stabbed them with the <laughs> surgical devices. But they're, uh, they're ready to go. And they can take oral antibiotics and go home. But a minimum of a week. So Dr. Stuntz, uh, we only have about a minute r remaining. What are some of the symptoms that a person will feel to make them think they need to get to the emergency room and be evaluated by a doctor, whether it could be appendicitis or, or mm -hmm. cholecystitis, gallbladder disease, et cetera. What are some of the symptoms that will tell a person, I need to go to the emergency room, as opposed to, this is just a tummy ache and I mm -hmm. uh, it might last a day or two. Like, what will a person experience to tell them, I need to go to the emergency room? Well, I think some of the big ones are high fever, serious abdominal pain to a level you're, you've never had before or very rarely had before, um, to the point where you probably can't walk or you can't really move much without it hurting a, a lot. And then chills, sweats, some of the other signs like severe vomiting, uh, severe nausea, um, total not abil inability to eat, uh, those kind of things would be 
the things that I would say would be the most prominent. Okay. Dr. Stuntz, I've learned a lot, and <laughs> as you know, I love these segments where I learn a lot and we <laughs> teach the public. It's great. I hope you come on again. Okay. Uh, let me give your contact information, if that's okay. Dr. Michael Stuntz, yes. general surgeon. You're here in Monterey, California, mm -hmm. and uh, you have an office number or a website? Yes. Uh, so our office phone number, 831-649-0808, and our website is montereysurgeons.com. MontereySurgeons.com. Dr. Michael Stunts, mm -hmm. general surgeon here in Monterey, California. Thanks very much for being on the program. All right, thanks for having me. Once again, I'm Dr. David Morewood. This is the Doctor is in Television program. We're going to take a very brief pause for a very good cause. I hope you stay with us. It's scary making the, the decision to have um, reconstructive surgery, but it's so worth what you get out of it. I'm stress free. I know I'm not going to get breast cancer. Everything is back to normal and it really did not take long to bounce back. I have a, a sense of hope for other women that this surgery can help them to live normal lives. This year more than 200,000 women in this country will be diagnosed with breast cancer. For many of them a mastectomy or removal of the affected breast will be recommended as part of the cancer treatment. The idea of losing a breast for some women can be almost as difficult as being diagnosed with breast cancer. Modern breast reconstruction can help. The purpose of this presentation is to provide women with valuable information about the major issues in breast reconstruction. We'll have an opportunity to speak with women who chose different methods of reconstruction. We'll talk to experts in the field of breast cancer and we'll let you know your options for breast reconstruction. I embraced the mastectomy and reconstruction procedure and because of that I had a terrific outcome and it's changed my life in a positive way. For the thousands of women who will be diagnosed with breast cancer this year we understand this is most likely a troubling and frustrating time. We hope this presentation has been valuable to you and will help you make some very difficult decisions that you're facing. Welcome back to the Doctor Is In Television program. I'm Dr. David Morwood. I am a board certified plastic surgeon right here in the incredible Monterey Peninsula. I'm delighted you could be here and I'm delighted to have on as a very special guest today, Dr. Richard Gray, cardiologist here at the Community Hospital of Monterey Peninsula. And I believe you're the director or one of the directors. Isn't that right, Dr. Gray? A director of the Tyler Hart Institute uh, at Community Hospital. Well, wonderful. Yeah, Dr. Right, right. Dr. Gray, we're delighted to have you here. Typically, we find doctors with your type of training and qualifications only at big universities and big cities. We're delighted to have you here. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. Delighted to be here. So, Dr. Gray, before we get into the topic that I want to learn about today so we can teach our patients and public, 